Welcome to the Scoop Road Order. It is Sunday. Uh, the Bucks basketball team got a nice dub. Is there a five-star flip coming for Brian Hartline and our offense? Uh, another one that is uh, almost a, an annual occurrence at this point. Uh, a spring game meetup has been planned for a Buckeye Scoop. Uh, we're going to fill you in on all of that and uh, see if you guys want to show up. Uh, you guys talk about what to do. Let's see if we can do it. Merchandise is coming this week. It's going to be a great week. Uh, and the team is on spring break, so we're going to get into all that. What is spring break entailing for Ryan Day, the coaches, the players, what planning goes on? What are the players doing? Uh, we're going to break kind of all that down. What's it look like spring break around the Woody Hayes? It's pretty dark, pretty quiet, uh, but we're going to get into all that. As always, thank you guys uh, for kicking it with us each and every night. Uh, this is a huge show because you guys make it a huge show. So thank you for the, the super chats are great. The questions are great. Again, you guys bring really insightful stuff. It's always exciting to see uh, what you guys are going to ask. Because I think that that's probably the best part of the show for me is uh, when some of you guys ask some of these incredible questions, stuff that, frankly, I haven't thought of. And uh, it's stuff that I think is usually something that's insightful, something where I can kind of uh, lend some expertise towards it. So I thank you guys for that, as always. Uh, the Super Chats have gone into the Pit Forward Fund. I signed up a couple more members yesterday. You guys know who you are. Appreciate you guys uh, joining the fray on BuckeyeScoop.com, the number one Ohio State message board. It's not even close anymore, and we're excited about all of our new members that are joining uh, in time for spring football. Uh, but again, if you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like, click subscribe. Also, click that little alert bell so you guys never miss a live show. Again, we are 250 subscribers away from 30,000. So it's been a long, strange trip, but we've been uh, rocketing up the charts right now. Thanks to you guys. Keep spreading the good word. Tell all of your friends that are Buckeye football supporters to check us out. Uh, and we're getting a lot of national people that are following us, too, that aren't Ohio State fans, just like to learn football. So... Uh, it's been unbelievable. And again, it's all thanks to you guys. So again, let's make this a big show. Again, it's uh, we got a lot of momentum right now. We appreciate you guys. Uh, and again, we're going to get into all of it right now. Nevada, it is spring break at the Woody Hayes. So the coaches are out of Dodge. The players are out of Dodge. Um, Thursday, they had their final practice. Friday, they had a, a workout. And then everybody was on the first thing smoking to get out of town, to get out of uh, the building. Um your thoughts on where Ohio State is after the first week of spring ball. Uh, I think that they're in a really good spot. Uh, these guys get to go blow some steam off. Uh, the coaches and you know, their families get to go get out of Dodge, get out of Ohio, go um, somewhere remote and quiet and you know away from the, the fervor of Ohio State football. How do you feel about this program after one week of spring football? Well, look, we're obviously in great shape. I mean, you know, you, you take a step back and kind of look where Ohio State is. Um, you know, on the college football landscape. And it's pretty obvious. You know, look, momentum is a real thing. Momentum is a real thing in business. Momentum is a real thing in life. And it's certainly a real thing in college football. And Ohio State right now is just the now program. Ohio, you, know, you know, things have fallen together for them perfectly from a staff perspective, um, from a re you know, returning player's perspective, the getting Chip Kelly perspective, from a health perspective. And, you know, how does that manifest itself? Well, it manifests itself in terms of you become the most attractive, you know, your destination for transfer portal players. Um, you become the most uh, attractive player for future recruits, high school players. Um, you become the most attractive, you know, place for uh, you know, people that want to invest NIL money or, or sponsorships or, in, you know, increasing the endowment. So, Look, as an Ohio State fan right now, with the with the departure of Nick Saban and you know, what's going on in the college football world, Ohio State's kind of ascended to the top right now, and um, it's kind of an amazing thing because we're not the defending national champion. You know, we haven't won a national championship since 2015 or 14 or whatever you know, whatever we want we want to call that, but. We're the, we're the best program in college football right now, and and that's where we sit. You know, two practices into into spring ball. That's where we practice. You know, that's where we sit, looking at the you know, 2025 high school recruiting class. And um, you know, it's rare error. We've got the the youngest, best coach, and the, uh, the, the the. It was funny. I was just reading an article, and they were talking about best coordinator combinations in college football and Notre Dame was trying to claim that they had the best offensive and defensive coordinator combination. And then even there at the end of the article, they had to say, well, maybe Chip Kelly and Jim Knowles at Ohio State's better. But, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's just an amazing spot to be in. And, 
where you find yourself is that everybody wants to to jump on the train. And so where do we sit? Well, now we sit with a possible five-star flip for another program because everybody wants to be part of the, uh, the, the Ohio State you know, tr- you know, train because it's leaving the station and uh, they don't want to get left behind. I think it's uh, – that's bold for Notre Dame to claim that. I mean, I, don't, I can't imagine anybody would, would – like, if if a fan or a program, if they said, hey, you can switch your OCDC with with anybody, I can't imagine someone not taking Chip Kelly, uh, at a minimum Chip Kelly. Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, it, it's one of those, those deals where you, then you throw in Jim Knowles, and I'm like, that's the best coordinator combination that we've had – maybe ever. And again, like, I'm not trying to be like captain superlative here, but it's like, that is, I mean, that's rare. You got a guy who's a NFL head coach and did so much at Oregon. So innovative. Um, and now he just gets to coach the part of the ball that he's excellent at. Again, like a lot of, uh, people would, would dig at chip because, you know, uh, defense wasn't always his forte because he was so offensive. And I think sometimes when you go ultra fast, it can leave your defense kind of hanging out to dry a little bit. Um, and we've seen that you know, with San Francisco. Obviously, they're, they're defending 90 plays a game instead of 60, like most teams. But I think that now that he's just coaching one side of the ball, I think it's as good as it can possibly get for Ohio State. And he is uh, an authority. He's going to develop that staff. Because, again, the, the thing I'm excited about is, like, I'm excited to see Brian Hartline get better. Like, Brian Hartline's got to get better. I think, you know, Keenan Bailey obviously has to get much better. Uh, Tony Alford can get better. You know, I mean, there's a lot of these guys that they've got another level they need to get to. Some of those guys have like 10 levels they need to get to. Uh, and I think Chip Kelly can help do that. Because again, Ryan Day running the show last year, is, it's been good. I mean, our offense has been really good the last few years, but it's not the same as having a guy truly run it like Chip Kelly will. So I think that'll be fantastic. Nevada, uh, with uh, this first week being over, some commitment news, uh, potentially. Yeah, again, it's still early. Um, we're we'll talking a little bit about the Corian Moore. This is this kid is a really good looking kid. We uh, we got his film. We'll get that going for you. Uh, let me switch my outlet real quick. But I uh, I really like this kid. He's five eleven, buck seventy five. Um, Duncanville kid, uh, which is one of the best high schools in all of Texas. Five star, number one player in Texas, number one receiver in Texas. Uh, Number three, national overall player. So this is a pretty gaudy uh, kid in terms of ranking. Um, your thoughts on this kid? Because uh, I think there's flip watch here with Brian Hartline with this offense. Uh, it's like good begets good. And that is the story of our wide receiver room. Uh, but your thoughts on DeCorean Moore? Well, help the helping technician who's a great insider, a great guy's got some great insight into what's going on at Ohio State. Um, you know, uh, I haven't really been paying that much attention to Decorian Moore until he said just pay attention to Decorian Moore. And when he says that, I start to kind of pay attention because I know that it's starting to get real. Um, but there's genuine interest, and there wasn't for a while. And I think this is a classic example of Brian Hartline doing Brian Hartline things. He's kind of got Ohio State back in the game. And my understanding is that uh, Decorian Moore is going to be up in Columbus on the 18th. And at that point, it's game on. And he's an LSU commitment, five-star wide receiver. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, number th- number three or number four per, you know, player in the country. But, I mean, you know, top five player in the country. And what's interesting about that 2025 class is, you know, you've got Ohio State who's already got commitments from Sanchez, uh, you know, who some people have as high as three, Offered, who's like five, Tavian St. Clair, who's like six. So you're literally, t- you know, you get more, and you're talking about having the three, four, five, and six players in the country uh, for the 2025 class all coming to Ohio State. And that's even before you throw guys like Fahim Delane, Trey McNutt, Dorian Brew, you know, into the mix. So the 2025 class is shaping up to be one for the ages. We, we've kind of gone through a, a, uh, a exercise yesterday going through the great 03 class and um, or what, it was the, no, it was the 02 class. It was the great 02 class. And then the, uh, the Burt Carton 03 class and almost brought the uh, the school down. But, um, you know, the 2025 class is shaping up to be one for the ages. And this guy would be an unbelievable flip. And Ohio State thinks they're – I mean, they think they're in the game. And he's coming up here on the 18th, so they're absolutely in the game. And let's see what what Ohio State can do here. But this this would be a big one. He is a, he's a freaky dude now. I mean, it's just funny. He is pure burner. When he gets loose, man, I mean, he – 
He's put on. And it's, I always love watching these these Texas high schools play football because the the stadiums they play in they either aren't colleges, they look like colleges, or they're just you know, here. They're playing in obviously at Jerry World, but I mean, you know, they, they look like college teams when they're playing. So I mean, it's a different level. Uh, but this kid is an absolute burner. Um, kind of reminds me of Olave. Which again, that's a pretty gaudy comparison given how good Chris Olave's been in the NFL. But if he gets his hands on it, man, he's going to the crib. And he is yard after catch gold like a Justin Jefferson. Or if he touches it, man, he's going he's going vertical and fast. And he is uh here he high points it on a guy. Not a not a huge guy, five eleven, but he is uh he's a nightmare now when he gets that ball here, he's returning a punt. Um that's scary punting it from your own end zone to this guy. A lot of green grass, and he is uh Really shifty. I mean, this kid would be unbelievable to get. Um, compliment that room. We got some super chats. Tony Turley, what is up, my man? Thank you for being a Scoop Ultra member. Thank you for the 50. Thank you for being our resident uh, legal guru on here. Appreciate you, brother, as always. Uh, Kirk in Nevada, I have been seriously trying to find a Wolverine jerky for Cujo, but it turns out it's not available because Wolverines are an endangered species. Huh. How ironic <laughs> is that Nevada OH? I O. That is, I learned so much in that. So, I mean, I, I had no idea that there was even a thing. I mean, I'm sure you're looking for Wolverine jerky, which is hilarious, but, you know, like people eat like alligators and stuff like that. So I was like, I'm sure that somewhere, somehow, some way, somebody's eaten a Wolverine before. But yeah, you don't see many of those things running around like you do the varmints that you run over on the highway. Um, but I guess they are going to get ran over this year. But, um, did you know Nevada that an actual Wolverine, not the Michigan Wolverine, since they're about to get smacked by the NCAA, but an actual Wolverine is endangered? Because I did not know that. Well, they're certainly an endangered species as far as I'm concerned, because like you said, they're about to get whacked. Um, we can talk about them getting whacked, you know, this year for the NCAA. They're about to get whacked, I think, <laughs> this week in a booming expose that could hit any time. Not sure if it's going to be Monday, not sure if it's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, but just keep an eye out to remember when you, where you heard it from. But I think there's something, I have a sneaking suspicion that something's going to be coming out that's going to uh, take a blowtorch to the Michigan Athletic Department and uh, all the malfeasance that's going on there. So um, just a hunch. But uh, if you're uh, an Ohio State fan, if you enjoy watching the misery of the endangered Wolverines, then uh, keep an eye out. Uh, on Twitter, keep an eye out, you know, on whatever, however you consume your media, because I have a sneaking suspicion it could be coming down anytime. Yeah, I think it's going to be a uh, fantastic when it all comes down. Uh, appreciate you, Tony. You're the absolute man. Uh, Sam Hammond, thank you for the 10. Kirk, did you ever watch the HBO OSU versus that team at North special? They came out just after Bo passed. I like to watch it the week leading up to the game to get extra hyped up. The funny thing about that documentary is it actually came out in 2007, which happened to be my senior year. So I watched it the week that I was getting ready to play my last Michigan game. Um, Cause it was, it was about the Oh six game. That was obviously the one versus two game. It's really, really, really well done. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure 90% of you guys have seen it. Uh, I think it might be on YouTube, but it was, uh, you know, it talks about kind of the history of the rivalry it, you know, it's something honestly that I think that the current players should sit and watch at some point. And, and again, I know that they're busy because they're, you know, um, doing whatever. But like, I, I I don't feel like kids understand the Michigan game anywhere near as well as we used to because we're just not we're not as Ohio based. Like our coaches and our coaches aren't from Ohio. Um, that was a big thing that Urban Meyer talked about his his first year is that every single guy on the staff had some sort of an Ohio tie, which was interesting. Like, you know. Tom Herman was born in Cincinnati. He might have been born there for, and lived there for six months of his life, but it still counted. Uh, I think maybe Everett Withers was the only guy that didn't, but everybody else had Stan Drayton was from Cleveland. Obviously, Luke Fickle, Zach Smith, you know, born, raised in, in Ohio. Um, I, don't, I don't feel that as much anymore. I mean, it's, it's not the end of the world, but I don't think people understand the rivalry as much. And that's a really good show to watch. And there's a lot of really good documentaries on the history of Ohio State, Ohio State, Michigan. And that, that's right at the top in terms of production quality. Um, obviously, they talked about Bo Schembechler passing because he passed literally like the night before. or like, It was like the Thursday before. Uh, I think he was on his TV show and he talked to the team and, and he felt faint and had you know, a heart attack or whatever it was. It was terrible. 
Um, but yeah, I uh, I love that show. And, and again, I, I I swear it came out in 07. Um, yeah, but it was uh, it was fun like playing in that game. Yeah, because I wasn't like interviewed or anything in it, but like there's little glimpses of me like on certain plays because obviously I played the whole game. So, uh, but it's a really good show. Nevada, uh, have you? seen the hbo special on oc versus the team up north that came out after both pass because i i think it's it's one of the best ones made yeah no i i have i i i love consuming all of that stuff and um i you know i can't get enough of the uh the stuff about the rivalry and i and i agree with you i think something's kind of been you know lost in the translation where people don't really that you know some of the players don't really understand um you know rivalry and, and, and you know for me it was always, you know, when I was raised, it was just about, you know, you, you had to be Michigan because that was kind of the game that kind of defined the season. And now I think it's harder to sell that to the players because, you know, it's not true anymore. You know what I'm saying? That like, like you don't need to be, you know, it's great to be Michigan, but with the 12 team playoff and the big team championship and everything else, you know, like if you're not really drawn on a kind of like a historical hate for Michigan and a genuine dislike for the program and, and that stuff, you know, if you're just looking at the game in the context of the 2024 season or, or beyond, you know, it's just another game. And um, I think we just have maybe too many players that don't have really an appreciation for what the game means to the state, what the game means to the people that have been here before and the people that, you know, the players that played here before and everybody that's a fan of Ohio state and, um, yeah, I would make that required viewing for anybody so they could at least get a sense of the rivalry and try to, uh, try, try to clue into it. Cause I thought it was, it was really well done. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up with a natural hate for Michigan because they beat us every year. And like, if you grew up in Ohio in the nineties, like, and you can think of people cause you, you guys will all have people flash before you guys when I say this. And I mean this sincerely, the biggest douchebags in the entire universe were people that lived in Ohio and were Michigan fans. And it was because in the mid nineties and 97, when they won it with Woodson, they were like in vogue. They were like the bad boys. They had Chris Weber and Juwan and the fab five and the black socks and the baggy baggy trunks. And like, I grew up in, you know, I grew up in Florida, so there wasn't as much of the Michigan stuff, but then I moved up here and, you know, Michigan would win every year. They'd beat us and the basketball team was good. And they're a bunch of thugs and, and so people like they liked that. That was like the they were like the the hip team to root for. You know, like Kevin Garnett liked Michigan, and I mean, but I just I remember like in middle school and high school, I was like, why do all these douchebags like Michigan? Why do I see all these people like walking around at the mall in Michigan stuff? You know, like we live in Ohio, just because they're douchebags is it because they're front runners? Usually it's both because it's the same people that like they probably like you know like Georgia football now or they like the Yankees or the Lakers or whatever. And they've never been to Los Angeles or New York, but that's just, that just happens to be who they root for because they're douchebags. And again, those are the people that I, I just, I couldn't wait to go to Ohio state. I couldn't wait to beat Michigan and just completely eradicate those people. Cause like, the thing about like us is like, you know, like when I go, like if I could beat something down and kill it, then it gives me a lot of happiness like joyfulness. Like the, the thing that makes me happy in life is like destroying all those Michigan fans. Cause when we, when we beat them, God, like from Oh one, they beat us in Oh three, they beat us in 11, but like from Oh one, they beat us like two times in like 20 years. So you didn't see these douchebags running around in Michigan stuff everywhere. Uh, they, they just, they, they evaporated. Now the last couple of years since we spit the bit, you know, and, and we've gotten, you know, annihilated by Michigan. Even if they're cheating, they still beat us. You know, it's been, they, they're back. So, again, like, that's why this year is critical because, like, you got to get back to getting these people out of here. Because, again, I see, I've seen more Michigan stuff the last three years than I did for 20 years. And, again, that was because, you know, when you're getting smacked every year, like we did, like Trust did and Urban did, then it's a different level. And, again, I, you know, kids, I think kids that grew up the last 20 years, which, again, this is all, you know, freshmen, sophomores juniors are all t about 20 years old they've never seen michigan like destroy ohio state like like i did in the 90s where guys like orlando pace who's like you know thanos and eddie george and all these like great players who has like there's no way they're gonna beat us we got eddie george he's gonna win the heisman loss 
they can't beat us. We got Orlando Pace. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna win the national chip. Loss. So again, like you know, w- when you see great teams crumble in the face of Michigan, like it gives you like kind of an extra edge because you realize like you know the the margin for error is so small. You better be on point. And again, thank Christ, I thank Christ every day that I have Troy Smith because I, I tell you what, if we have Troy Smith, we're probably the same as those teams in the '90s. Troy Smith was the ultimate Wolverine killer. And that guy, if you go back and watch that 04, that 05, 06 game, he played better than anybody in the history of the Robbers. He played, he played good Michigan teams. He didn't play some of these patsies that we've beaten on. Um, you know, I mean, he played Chad Henney, who's an NFL quarterback for 15 years, beat him every single time. Uh, so Troy played like real teams. Lloyd Carr won a national championship. He didn't get to feast on Brady Hoke and Rich Rod and some of these other turds, um, let alone Jim Harbaugh, who was a doofus until the last three years. So, you know, I, I just, Again, thank Christ we had Troy Smith. So there's my rant for this evening. But uh, that's how I feel. Jared Haddle, the king of Chillicothe. Appreciate you. Thank you for the 10. I expect you to be a Buffalo Wild Wings for the spring game. Buffalo Wild Wings, 9 a.m. is going to be the meetup. I'm going to uh, post that. I need to get a head count. So if you guys want to come to the Scoop meetup, Buffalo Wild Wings, Lane and High, right on campus, a five-minute walk from the Horseshoe. Uh, we're going to be there at 9 a.m. to about 11.30. I'm going to post that all over creation. You guys will not miss it. But I'd love to see you guys out there. Jared, thank you for the 10, my friend. I don't want to sound arrogant, but I fully believe that we're about to see a dynasty like Alabama here pretty soon at Ohio State. I'm calling it right now. Also, hope you guys had a great weekend. I yeah, I think that we've got, we've got a lot of very, very interesting pieces as part of the puzzle at Ohio State right now. And the thing I love... We have a young coach who's a quarterback developer in Ryan Day. We have a guy who's kind of on the back nine, but he's a genius in Chip Kelly, uh, who I think is really going to genuinely enjoy being a coordinator working for Ryan Day. I mean, I know that you know he wanted to be a coordinator in the NFL. He interviewed for about every job known to man in this offseason, the Steelers, the Seahawks. Like He was trying to get an NFL gig. But I think to work for Ryan Day will reinvigorate him a little bit because he's working with a guy that he'll be in lockstep with and – you know, again, like if you go work for some random head coach in the NFL, there ain't no guarantee that that's going to be a great marriage. You know, you might work for some guy you can't stand, some guy you hate, some guy that fires you in a year. So I think that working with with Ryan will reinvigorate him a little bit. Um, you got Jim Knowles, who's a, you know, a little bit older guy, um, not the most desired. I mean, obviously he interviewed with Duke. Um, I think kind of just to touch the base and say that he's interviewing with Duke. But he's the guy that can be locked in here for a few you know, years, like for a decent term. Uh, as the DC. So you've got, you know, again, the, the hardest part about these dynasties, like in the thing that made Nick Saban, the greatest coach that's ever lived is the fact that he was able to switch out his coordinators basically every year because teams would poach them and make them their new head coach. Um, Tennessee, Florida, uh, Auburn, you know, these guys are all poaching their, the, the guys to, to, you know, build their programs. You know, Lane Kiffin obviously goes to FAU goes, now he's at Ole Miss Guys that go to the NFL, Sarkeesian went to Texas. I mean, he had, he had a revolving door, and I don't think we're going to have that. I think that Chip and Jim Knowles are going to be here for at least a couple more years uh, together, which I think is great for uh, alignment of the program. So, uh, But I like it, and I also had a great weekend because uh, I get to podcast every night and kick it with you guys. Nevada, Jared uh, believes that we're about to have a dynasty like Alabama pretty soon at Ohio State. What are your thoughts on that? I absolutely believe that to be true. I, I believe that there's a void that has been created by Saban leaving. And it, there was, it was a question of so, somebody was going to fill that void. Somebody was going to kind of ascend to the throne, as it were. And I absolutely believe that school's Ohio State. Um, I think it'd be the school with the best coaches, uh, with, a, you know, with a tuned up NIL program, uh, with, a, you know, with a, a, a kind of a sexy brand. Um, you know, playing on a, a, a big network platform. Um, look, we check all the boxes and for Ohio State, I mean, we're the now program right now. And, and you, you might say, well, what does that matter? Well, it matters when those kids are going to the portal. It matters with recruits. It matters as you're kind of going through this thing because, you, you know, you're only as good as the players that you have. You're only as players as the players that you can get. We've got another transfer portal uh, window opening up. Um, maybe you add another piece or two. Maybe you, you even get better. You try to even make it even more unfair than it's already going to be in 2024. And I love where we're sitting. And to, 
to reflect upon where we were and where a lot of people were in terms of the depths of despair at the Cotton Bowl at the end of December, and you fast forward, you know, to you know the basically the beginning of March, and we're talking about a dynastic period for Ohio State. It just reminds you how truly blessed we are to be Ohio State fans and never take it for granted. You know, never just kind of, you know, just kind of blow it off because it's truly amazing what has gone on here the last, you know, eight to 10 weeks at Ohio State. It's been an amazing, amazing time to uh, to be a fan. And um, I, like I said, I, I could not be happier with where we are. You know, I won't say we're, you know, we're not perfect, but man, we've had a, uh, we've had the best off season in Ohio State history by far. And I think it's going to be an unbelievably special season in 2024, and I, I'm enjoying every day of it. Yeah, I every day is a blessing uh, with the off season we've had. I think it's the best off season in Ohio State history, um, and I've been around for a lot of them. And I don't remember this kind of buzz, this kind of upgrade. And we upgraded every single part of the team this off season. So, um, yeah, I'm excited about it. Neil Harris, thanks for the deuce, the four one one deuce. Appreciate you, brother. I love when you say that. That's a great little uh, nickname. Um, that might be on a merchandise shirt pretty soon here. So appreciate you, my man. Donald and Karen Rossbach, thank you for the five. The Wolverines will definitely be endangered after the NCAA hammers them. Nevada OH. I O. I think it's gonna be it's gonna be glorious. And and I'm telling you, man, it's like even my heart is gone now, which is crazy when you think about. I've never seen a team lose basically their entire staff minus like three guys. I mean, from, and I'm talking from the strength coach. I mean, it's, it's, it's obscene. And you know, the, the, the Mike Hart thing is really weird to me because Jim Harbaugh obviously did not want him. You know, Jim Harbaugh's worked with him for the last, you know, however many years he's been at Michigan um, that since he, since he hired Mike Hart and he didn't take him to LA and then Mike does not get retained by the Wolverines um, I think that they were trying to do right by him and help him try to find a job. Cause I believe like something is up there between him and Sharon Moore. Cause like, you don't, you don't just bullet like the leading rusher in program history. Um, or if he's not enough quorum pass him, but he was when he left Michigan, he was the leading rusher in program history. So to bullet that guy, um, something's up there and he didn't leave for a job. He's just kind of out in orbit right now. So that is weird. Uh, Nevada, um, you definitely believe that the Wolverines are about to be endangered after they get the hammer dropped on them. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, the, you're, you're talking about a program that very shortly will have lost their college football, their head coach, their basketball head coach, and their athletic director, you know, all within you know a few months of each other. And as you mentioned, the other, you know, they've gutted their staff. Um, no, they're like they're 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 in deep trouble right now as Michigan fans. They know it. The, the people around the Michigan program know it. Um, but you know, look, it, it it couldn't happen to a more you know. You talk about the arrogance of the Michigan fan. Well, that is the understatement of the year because they they really. I, I'm trying to think about a, a more arrogant fan base that is that has accomplished so little. Like you would think that, you know. Yeah, they've gotten over us. They cheated the last few years and gotten over on us. But you would think that they've beaten us twenty years straight. The way that they kind of strut around like they're uh, like the cocks of the walk, and it's amazing to me. To um, you know, when you talk to Michigan fans, just the, the you know, like, it's like the last twenty years didn't even happen, and that you know, football started in in twenty twenty one with the cheating scandal in twenty twenty one, and 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 nothing's mattered since then. But it's going to be great when they, the world can get back to spinning on the right axis here in November of 2024 when we, uh, when we get them in Columbus and, and I'm going to be there and enjoy every single minute of that. Oh, I think that's uh, I think you're right. I mean, this is going to be a great off season for Buckeye fans. Super excited about it. Oh, Pooh beard. This is hilarious. Uh, Pooh beard. Thank you for the 12 uh, or excuse me. Thank you uh, for being an ultra member. Thank you for the 10. Uh, I saw the Pooh beard 12 and I said, thank you for the 12. This is hilarious. At my at the gym, jacked up on pre workout. Might be my new favorite way to listen to the scoop. What pre workout are you taking? I used to be an endo explode guy, and that stuff was absolutely terrible for you. But when I was a player, I used to take it every day, and it was awful. Like I'll never do it again. Uh, thank God. Uh, LFG, love you, my man. Predictions for biggest impact players on O and D who do not begin. The season as starters, Nevada, O-H-I-O. 
I'll let you go first. I already know who you're going to pick. So go ahead and go. You don't even know. You have no idea who I'm going to pick. I, like, you're going to say, you're, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna say Jeremiah Smith. Go ahead and say it. No. He's just going to be a starter. I'm not going to say a guy that's going to be. I actually listen oh, you to you, 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 you think he's going to start? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. See, I actually read the questions and respond to the questions. Okay. Well, let's hear it. Okay. My and Well, first of all, before I get into that, I know we have a ton of people watching us on Twitter right now. If you are, if you want the best viewing experience, you go to YouTube. If you want to participate in the show and you want to ask super chat questions, go to YouTube and you can do that. But we're so glad you're, uh, you're watching us. We have a ton of people watching us on these alternate streams and uh, so glad you are here. And you can listen to, to Kirk and I go back and forth on this. So, okay. The parameters are not a starter, but high impact. So I'm going to go with on offense. I am going to go with, can I go with Quinshawn Judkins? Can Quinshawn Judkins be considered not a starter because Trey Henderson will be technically a starter? Can that, that's kind, that of, count? That's kind of, that's kind of cheating, but I'm fine with it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll take that one as my, my one pick. And then my second pick is on defense. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with Gabe Powers. Gabe Powers is going to be my, not a starter, but going to make an impact. I just have a feeling he's going to come on and he's going to explode. And And I think when he gets on the field and they start getting him some time, uh, I just don't see how he doesn't grab the the, uh, the bar and run with that. I think so. I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with Quinshaw Jenkins, who's not technically a starter on offense. And I'm going to go with Gabe Powers on defense as my two unsung impact players all right uh for me god i really want to say kenyatta really really want to say kenyatta jackson um he had a huge first week you know i think that you got to have a third defensive end this year you got to have a pass rusher um the hardest part for me is like is projecting CJ Hicks or Sonny. I assume Sonny's going to start over CJ because I think that whoever doesn't win that, who's technically a bench player, could be the, that'd be like the easiest answer ever because they're they're both going to play a lot. Um, see, I think Will Casimiric is a guy that could have a big impact, but it won't be a statistical impact. But he's a he's a million times better blocker than G Scott. But I think G Scott will be kind of like the ceremonial starter just because he's been here and you know, he's been around the program for four or five years, whatever it's been. Um, people like him. So I, I imagine he'd be the guy that like gets the first snap. So he'll technically be the starter. But I think Will Kazimierz, the guy, first week, did really good. I mean, he, he's not scared. Uh, tough kid, big kid, physical kid. And I think if we're going to pulverize in the running game, you got to have a guy that can hold the edge as a tight end. So. You know, but it's just hard because, you know, how do you measure blocking? Because there's no, like, it's not like, you know, he's going to, I can't say, oh, he's got to come off the bench and have, you know, 25 catches and five touchdowns or whatever. But I think he's going to be a dramatic uptick in our blocking. Um, he's mature. Again, he's played a lot. Athletic dude. So, I mean, those are going to be my kind of off the wall picks. Um, God, and I'd love to see Hero Canoe do something. So I'm not, I'm not going to pick five guys. So I'll say my final answer would be Will Kazimerick and Hero Canoe. So out of left field, um, as much as I wanted to do Kenyatta, I just think Hero is more consistent. Um, and I think Kenyatta could get supplanted by either Andrew Houston or Caden Curry. So for me, I'm going to go Hero because you got to find a third D tackle. Like that is like paramount right now. And Hero is a big physical kid, and he's had a, he had a great offseason with Mickey in winter workouts. So, again, I trust the people I talk to, and uh, you know when you're when you're trying to like when you do what Nevada and I do, when you're trying to diagnose who could break out, who could have a real rotational role on the team, you really look at who are the guys that had big winners because it's kind of a progression. Okay, he had a good winter. Okay, he had a good spring. He had a good summer. Okay, now he's kind of checked the boxes. Like I, I just I haven't seen many guys that oh he was trash in the winter, late, lazy, not showing up, not giving effort. Mickey's got to ride him all the time, and 
you know, had the team have to come in and do Dawn Patrol. Like I've I've seen that movie before, and those guys never end up flourishing. And then I've seen the guys where like the light bulbs going. Like that's why I'm really excited about Sonny Styles. I know a lot of people are kind of wait and see mode with Sonny because he looks like Tarzan and he hasn't played, you know, to the level that people expect a five star number one ish type player in the country to play. Um, but you know, he, he had a huge winner. I mean, he was one of the, the top three guys on the entire team this winter, um, in terms of production grades, you know, they, they grade you on everything. Like, I mean, that's the thing is it's not like when you or I go to lifetime fitness or planet fitness or whatever, and go work out, like, like that's just a workout, but you don't get graded on every little thing. Like you do at the Woody Hayes, they grade you on everything. So he was one of the top three most productive guys, super explosive, looks great. He's humongous. Like, I don't know. I'm excited about uh, our boy, Sonny. I think this is going to be a huge spring for him. But before we get the next question, I got a question for you. Saw that Roger Clemens came and pitched for the Savannah Bananas yesterday at 61. Came out there, pitched, wanted to pitch to his son, Cody. So they brought him out there. Uh, you guys haven't seen the Savannah Bananas. Unbelievable show. Kind of the Harlem Globetrotters like of baseball. They put on a great show. They play against the party animals that are kind of the, the Washington generals of the other team. Really, really entertaining. So my question for you, if we gave you 30 days, could you, tr- how would you do, Kirk, if we lined you up for, th- we gave you 30 days to train, prepare, but you had to go out and play a half of Ohio State football. How would you do? Would you grade out? Like, would you be great? Would you be okay? Would you be a revolving door out there? Scale of one to 10, how would Burt Carton do? with 30 days to train and prepare for one final game. And, and I'm playing against like Ohio, like playing in the spring game ish type thing. No, you're playing like a real team. You're playing like a, like a Penn state or something like that. I mean, I could probably be like a seven, I bet no, I'm 39. Nice. So I'm getting up there, but it's like, I mean, it would be, let's get in ripper shape. I mean, I'd be running, every day i mean i'm still strong know the game um and it just depends on again it all depends on who you're playing against so if you're playing against you know nick bosa that's a whole different ball of wax than playing against just a regular player so um but i think i can get there i mean i'm still strong like i worked out i did five miles on the stairmaster today so i'm still moving around i didn't get too winded too gas so it's like i don't know like i mean Am I going to be as good as I was when I was 23 and I was, you know, repped and training for three hours a day, eating, you know, really, really well? Like, probably not. But, I mean, if I really dialed it up, I probably – I mean, I'm, I'm sure I could get there if I really focused. I mean, it's it's just one of those things where if there was something major at stake, yeah, I could absolutely step up and do it. Um, but I'm a competitor. It's kind of is what it is. Um, would I want to play a whole season? Hell no. No chance ever. But um, could I play one game? Yeah, of course. You know. Nice. Yeah, nice. Scared, mo- scared money don't make money, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, see how, many pod- how many Ohio State podcasters can say that? You know, I think you should ask that question to all your other Ohio State podcasters and say, hey, you had to suit it up for one game. You do. Now, I'm putting Burt Carton up there as our representative Buckeye Scoop, and we'll challenge all the other podcasters to see to like a game of football, and uh, well, winner takes all. I mean, you know, you know, those guys wouldn't break an egg. Are you crazy? <laughs> they think just because they're big and fat, they know like offensive line play. I'm like, are you crazy? Like some of these guys, I listen to what some of these guys say and I'm like, I'd be embarrassed. I was like, you guys are really trying to articulate football and you guys couldn't draw 11 guys on a chalkboard. You know, that's just how, I mean, it's, it is what it is. And again, God bless them. And you know, they can fool a lot of people, but there's a reason why people like to listen to our stuff is because they actually learn football. It's not just... Like, I didn't go to journalism school. I went to football school because people want to learn football. They don't learn how to be a journalist. So, again, and that's that's probably just me being whatever, but it's the truth. I mean, come on. What are we talking about here? Um, but, yeah, I, I'll be the delegate for us because I know you ain't going to get out there and do nothing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> the facts. From the, Those are fa- from, the, from, <laughs> from the sweet drinking hot cocoa rooting me on. Go, go down there, little plebeian. Go down there, little gladiator. <laughs> go, you're Julie, go. Like your Julie, your Julius Caesar sitting in your <laughs> up in your loft. Uh, that's true. It's funny because it's true. I um, yeah, that that is funny. But I, 
I don't know. I mean, it's it's like I said, like, when I was talking to you about that today. It's like when football's done, it is done. There ain't no rec league football. So when you're done, you're done, which is good. D Sunny, what's up, brother? Thank you for the five. Thank you for always bringing awesome questions because, again, you're one of the best people we have in the entire stratosphere of Buckeye Scoop in terms of your questions. If Mike Hart calls Ryan Day about an analyst position, would you want him to return the call? Hell no. No chance. <laughs> Are you crazy? Mike Hart, here's the thing. I think Mike Hart is the biggest douchebag in the history of Michigan. I'm not even kidding. He's been a total douchebag his whole career. And again, you know, I don't know what's going on with him, but I don't care. I don't want him anywhere near our program. But here's the facts. He got what he just got fired at University of Michigan, which, you know, he's a legend there. So to get fired at your your home school where you're a legend isn't good. So Jawan Howard is going to be on the bread line next to him in about a week. Um, and Jim Harbaugh did not take him to the Los Angeles Chargers. So, you know, the two guys that know him the best in the coaching profession are Jim Harbaugh and Sharon Moore. They didn't want anything to do with him. So he's obviously dumb or toxic or not a worker. I mean, th there's some major malfunction inside of Mike Hart right now as to why he's not a running back coach um, either in the NFL or at Michigan or anywhere. And again, maybe he'll land at Alabama. And maybe you say, Kirk, you're an idiot. He was, he was playing the long game to land at Georgia or Bama or some NFL gig or whatever. But the guy just got fired at Michigan. I mean, literally, they, they let him resign, but he got fired. Like, you don't – here's – Here's the thing in life, especially in coaching, but in life in general, most people don't just resign from a job where you're making, I don't know, $700,000 to not have another job where you're making $700,000. Like it ain't like Mike Hart resigned and then he resurfaced at Oklahoma or USC or Florida or wherever he just resigned, which that means you got fired. You know, they say, Hey, you know, so you can save face. We're gonna let you resign, but you know I, I'm sure that like he saw this coming and like he he had to have been surfing around trying to find a job somewhere you know, as a running backs coach and came up double zeros like the like the green roulette wheel. So you know I you know I mean if I, if, if he calls Ryan Day, I, I mean I know Ryan's not gonna take that call, but I would just want to know like dude, you just got fired by your alma mater and. You didn't, you know, you didn't get a job and I'm sure that he wanted the head coaching job. I mean, that's great. And that's amazing. Like I, I want to own the cosmopolitan of Las Vegas. So we'll see who gets that first. So, you know, I mean, you can wish and hope for whatever you want, but he wasn't qualified again. If you've never coordinated an offense or a defense, it's really hard to become a head coach. I mean, that you gotta be some wild prodigy like like urban meyer like urban meyer never coordinated an offense in his life and got hired to be the the head coach at bowling green but bowling green was atrocious they were like one in 11 they're the worst team in the mac and so urban you know they they interviewed him and offered him the job you know because i'm sure he crushed the interview they probably thought he was a psychopath and a maniac which he was and they thought well, hey this might be just what we need to turn bowling green around and guess what he did so, like, unless you're a monster, if you've never coordinated an offense or a defense, and I'm talking really coordinated, like you called the plays, not not just the title, your offensive coordinator, like you actually did the work. Um, it's really hard to become a head coach. So, I, I just, you know, Mike Hart is, I don't want to say he's radioactive, but he's radioactive. I mean, that's that's what he is. I mean, Jim Harbaugh didn't want him, and Sean Moore didn't want him, and he's on the bread line. Uh, Nevada. Uh, D Sunny asks if Mike Hart calls Ryan Day about an analyst position, would you want him to return the call? No, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> but but you think about think about Michigan. Okay, Michigan. You have Mike Hart, who, you know the whatever legend, legendary uh, legendary bike rider on the sideline that gets dismissed, uh, rejected, turned away, or whatever it is. Um, you have Matt Weiss, the quarterback coach, co-offensive coordinator that gets fired for the alleged sex crimes against minors. He's disappeared off the mat. Too. He doesn't have another job that he's kind of gone to. You've got Chris Partridge, Chris Partridge fired in the middle. Of the I mean, and then now you have seven coaches on top of that. I mean, has there ever been a program 
that have more turmoil around it than the Michigan Wolverines. And I, I, I just, I've never seen anything like it. It's, and the thing is, it's just starting. It's not like this is the end of the storm and at least we've made it through, you know, we're, you know, there's smooth sailing ahead and, you know, we can head on, you know, to, to through the Cape of Good Hope and make it to the Spice Islands. Like they haven't even hit the hurricane yet. And it's already like the weirdest thing that I've ever seen. So, um, uh, no heart to me is just another and a continuation of just was a, a absolutely bizarre series um, for Michigan coaches, for Michigan administration, for Michigan athletics, uh, but truly weird situation, but par for the course for 23, 24 for Michigan football. And let me tell you what, it isn't going to get any better guys. It's only going to get worse from here. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, like I said, that's a weird one. Because, again, like, you got to ask, you know, what what did you do that made you, you know, uh, uh, again, because I keep going back to, like, Sharon Moore. Like, if I'm Sharon Moore, I mean, you have to really hate somebody um, if you're trying to keep the program on a similar level to Jim Harbaugh. And Jim Harbaugh just happens to screw you and take, like, eight coaches from your staff. um like you'd want to try to retain as many guys as you can. And, you know, when it's a guy that's an alumni who played there and is a legend there and he's a running backs coach. Like, I mean, he's not like, like running backs is like tight ends. Like, those are the two easiest positions by far, by far to coach on the team. You coach one dude, that's it. And you've got like four guys in your room. Easiest position by far. So I, I, I just, you know, if you're trying to like keep some of that, that Harbaugh culture and that winning culture, you know, you don't want to retain some of those guys. And so to let another one of those guys go, um, to fire him, I mean, that's, you know, he had to have done something wrong. And, and it, I think what it comes down to is, uh, he probably, they probably hated each other. Like, I mean, it had to be like one of those things where it's so toxic, it couldn't work. And Sean Moore, who's now the boss, showed him the door, said, see ya. Josh Dillon, uh, my man, Nikita Kucherov. How are you? Thank you for the five. Appreciate you, brother. Hey, Kirk in Nevada. Uh, do you think now that Saban is gone, we have a better chance of getting kids in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana? I think that is a great question. Nevada, I'll let you start on this one. Uh, do you think we have a better chance of getting kids from Alabama, Miss- uh, getting Alabama, excuse me, getting Alabama kids uh, from Mississippi and Louisiana? I think the gist of the question is, you know, are we going to have a better shot at getting kids from the South where we've been putrid? And it's almost to the point where we don't even really try down there. Well, I mean, it's true to a point, but, you know, we've done really well. I mean, not really well, but we've done well in Georgia. We've obviously always historically done well down in Florida. Now, the deep South down there, it, man, it's tough. It's just a tough pull. I'm trying to think about the, the, the Louisiana kids. I know we had got Nader, what, Adula. Uh, did we ever get anybody else from from Louisiana? You know, I'm trying to think about anybody from Mississippi. Uh, J- J- Jair Alexander was he from right. Louisiana? Jair, yeah, or Jair Brown? I don't even J- know. J- J- uh, no, Jair something, not Jair Alexander. Jair Brown. Yeah, yeah. Jair Jair Alexander is really good. He plays for the Packers. Man, we could use him. Man, he's well, he's quality. I, it, it was one of the Jairs, but I mean, here's the thing: if we get him and they never play here and they transfer out, then. Yeah, yeah. I, del- I, I, well, I, delete, they, I, I delete them from my memory log. You know, it's not they, like they might as, they, they might as well be Jair Alexander <laughs> at that point because it doesn't help yeah. us. Another, another guy yeah. who didn't help us, but no. But the, the point, look, those those are always tough places to do. But I mean, look, you know, Alabama. You know, why not? We, you know, we're getting transfers from Ole Miss now, and uh, you know, you get Davison, you get Quinshawn. Those are two pretty good players. Quinshawn, Alabama high school football player. So it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, Alabama. First of all, the state of Alabama is putting out some players and, you know, becoming more and more of a force in, in, in high school football. And with Saban gone, it's certainly, you know, Ohio State is the now program. Ohio State is the national program. Ohio State is the shining star that's out there. Uh, not the only shining star, but I think they're the, sh- the star that's shining the brightest. And I don't think there's a, a place in the country that Ryan Day can't walk into. Um, and with this recruiting staff where you've got James Laurinaitis, Tim Walton, uh, Brian Hartline, who are three elite level recruiters. Um, yeah, I, I don't believe there's anybody that we can't pull. So, so why not from those states? Yeah, for sure. I think we can do that. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I think that when you, you go down there, man, it's, 
you know, it's it's been tough sledding, and it's to the point where we really didn't try. Um, you know, it, it's I know that we went after Tackett Curtis, who was kind of a different kind of cat than the normal Louisiana kid. Um, but you know, like if there's a big defensive tackle in Louisiana who's awesome, like the odds of him not going to LSU are like zero. Because those kids grow up wanting to be LSU Tigers. Like, that's kind of the only school in town for those guys. Um, so we don't usually go after those kids. But I, I think that the star power evaporating from Bama helps. Because, you know, when you're Nick Saban and you walk into a high school in Louisiana or Mississippi or whatever, it's like like it's like it's Mick Jagger walking around. It's, 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 he's Nick Saban is a true A-list celebrity where everybody knows who he is and there's a different buzz. It's kind of like Urban. Urban was like that. I don't know if Ryan is to that level yet because he doesn't want a natty, but you know, Nick Saban goes into your high school. It's different. It's different. And Urban Trestle's like that, especially you know, Jim Trestle. He came to my high school like two weeks after winning the national championship, you know, to, to do like, you know, the home visit and, and do the high school visit to visit me. And like, my high school like had to like shut down because he was there. I mean, people were like chasing him in the hallways. He sat down and ate lunch with me at like the lunch table and like a line of like a hundred people formed. Like people wanted like hot dog wrappers signed and hostess cupcakes signed with a Sharpie. I mean, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. And I'm sitting there. We're just eating a little, I mean, you know, you know, Tress is the best ever. Cause like he'll sit and eat like the little tray of lunch from Perry high school. And he'll eat it. Like he's eating it. Like, like he's eating at Ocean Club or Town Hall or he's eating like fine dining. And that's why he was the best. And and I mean, the problem with him is like he was, he'd still be sitting there signing autographs. But my high school coach, who was a gangster and was awesome, he, he got he got everybody cleared out of there and they took him down to the office. But um, I don't know. I think we have a, I think the thing that gives us a better chance is Saban being gone and our NIL is killing it. Because, you know, the thing that's different now is, you know, when we used to cry the blues and whine about getting beat out by bag men. I, I think that that's all even now. I think that that's the best part about NL for Ohio State is we have Bagman and it's all legal now. So we can go after these kids and we can go get Caleb Downs. We can go get some of these superstars. And, you know, like if, if some of these kids don't like their situations and they want to come up to Ohio, hey, come on down because we got some uh, some scratch for you. Sloth Nations, this is a great question. Thank you for the 10. Happy Sunday. Uh, currently on a drive listening. Drive safe, my man. Appreciate you. Love you guys. How did y'all like UFC 299? Hope all is going well in Nevada. If you could pick any two schools to add to the Big Ten, who would they be and why? Uh, Nevada, I'm going to start with you because you are, uh, me and you both are UFC nuts, but you might be nuttier than I am, but I'm, I love the UFC. I've always loved the UFC. I've been going to the UFC since 06. I went to UFC 76. It was, it was Chuck Liddell versus Rampage, which is like one of the greatest fights. It was it was a 90-second fight, but it was amazing. Uh, Nevada, how'd you like UFC 299? Uh, first of all, for those that don't know, I'm a UFC junkie. Uh, we won't take too much time on the thing. I know this is a football show, an Ohio State football show, but um, background uh, had invested in a clothing line called Tap Out uh, a long time ago, so I was exposed to um, MMA when it was really, really in its infancy and, uh, you know, I've really always been a, a huge fan of the UFC, UFC 299. So much fun. Uh, if, if you are a regular listener to the show, I'm telling you, I went, I told you guys, I go, go to Dagestan Poppy. Uh, his, he, he's got his MMA picks. Uh, he's got his track record and he had another three winners last night. So, uh, three and oh, you could have made a lot more money on the thing. He's, uh, He's up like 129 units over the past 11 months, which is just a crazy, you know, insane return. It's like 70% ROI on his betting, um, but the best free MMA picker in the world. And, um, you know, we're great to have an affiliation with him. We're great that he's part of our site. But if you like MMA, I loved 299. I thought it was just an unbelievable card. Looking forward to 300. Um, but as much as I like watching UFC, I like making money and betting. I'm telling you that the MMA market is really inefficient. And you can make money betting MMA more so than any other sport uh, going because you can get – there's big levels and, and, the, and the lines can swing radically. Uh, you can get them early enough. But anyway, I had a big, another just huge night betting MMA, continuing the burner that we've been on on that. So, yeah, that was a great time last night. And, Kirk, you're on mute, I think. 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, and the second part is, I apologize. Uh, Nevada, if you could pick any two schools to add to the Big Ten, who would they be and why? No, so the, is the parameter they can be like from another like like could I take Texas? You know what I'm saying? Like that? Could I could I, mean, I take I, Texas? I, I, I mean, I mean, I mean the the exact question is you can pick any two schools. So I assume you could take Texas, you could take Bama, you could take LSU, you could take whoever I, I, Harvard. I, I, I mean, I would take I would take Notre Dame and Texas. I would take Notre Dame and take that. And I know Notre Dame, the Notre Dame one's not going to be met with wild. I know people are like, oh, Notre Dame, you know. I would take Notre Dame. Um, I think Notre Dame is one of those ones that's one of the true plums that's left out there. Um, if Texas was you know, was not part of it because it's not part of the ACC, you know, if the parameters were it has to be a realistic school that you could realistically have a chance to get, for me it would be Notre Dame and uh, North Carolina. Those would be, you know, I'd like UNC. I think UNC would be a terrific addition to the Big Ten and just, you know, a mortal blow to the ACC. And I, I, and I want to see the ACC fall and, uh, and, and, and go to the wayside. And I want to see all those teams be up for, for the grabs. But Notre Dame's the one I want. Um, always felt that they belonged in the Big Ten. Um, realized that they're very arrogant. They like the independence. But I think they're realizing that um, you know, now they've just made their, their path to the national championship even tougher because the top four seeds go to conference champions and they're not in the conference. So by, no matter how good they do, they're going to have to play one more game than the four conference champion winners. And you know, that's, uh, that's putting yourself at a huge disadvantage if you want to be competitive in college football. And I think that could ultimately drive them to a conference and ultimately to the Big Ten. For me, I, uh, I'd go Texas and Georgia. And I know Georgia is probably more short-term. They're obviously, not, they're not the brand Notre Dame is. I totally get that. But I think it would cripple the SEC. And I think that Kirby Smart's going to be there for – at least the next three to five years. So if you add them to the Big Ten, I just don't know how you ever lose the national championship because I think that uh, Georgia is always going to be right there. I think Bama is going to take a step back uh, with DeBoer compared to where they were with, uh, obviously, like, like you can't keep up where Nick Saban was. You know, Kalen DeBoer could walk into a high school and no player is going to know who he is. You know, obviously, we'll have the, 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 the regalia on, but that's not... That ain't like Saban walking in. Now Saban walks in, and it's like, oh my god, the, the the you know the the goat is in the building. So those would be my picks. Again, Georgia's probably doesn't doesn't make as much sense as Notre Dame. Notre Dame would bring huge TV money, so I'd probably get fired as commissioner. But I, I like Georgia football. I think those guys play hard. I think Kirby Smart does a great job. Um, well, we know they play hard. They played us really hard, and they were, if they would have gotten the playoffs, they probably would have won. I mean, I think that they would have given Michigan the best game by far. Um, even better than Alabama did. So, but that is a uh, that is a great question, uh, Josh Dillon. Again, thank you for the five. Do you think we need any offensive line transfers after spring? Well, uh, let me take a couple more weeks. I I would love to get Ozzy uh, Trapio. I've heard a lot of great things about the kid. Kind of a interesting situation. His father, um, Steve Trapio, was actually. Uh, an All-American at BC, played in the NFL. So he's a legacy there. And the thing that was really interesting, because I thought there was a shot that he could hit the portal. There was a real shot that he was looking around at it, is Bill O'Brien retained their offensive line coach. But then today, he goes out and hires Doug Marone. So Doug Marone is going to be an analyst. Doug Marone is one of the best line coaches in the entire country. He coached at Alabama. When Bill O'Brien was the offensive coordinator um, at Bama, uh, Bill, or excuse, yeah, Bill O'Brien was when he was the OC at Bama, like what two years ago. Um, Doug Marone is his O line coach, and Doug Marone's coach with the Saints. Uh, he's coached all over the place, and he is really, really well respected offensive line coach. And um, he was an NFL head coach with the uh, the Bills. Uh, he worked with the Jaguars. I mean, he's been all over the place, but he's an analyst there now, and so. You know, if I'm this O-line coach and, like, all of a sudden Doug Marone shows up in the building, I'm like, like is, is like, is this spring game an audition for me? Like, could I get supplanted? Um, you know, because, like, when you're, like, a good young line coach, like, like Boston College guy, I think he does a good job. Um, but then they bring in Doug Marone behind you. You're just like, ooh. Um, you know, because, I mean, I, I could see there, there being a, a succession planning thing there because you've got a really good guy there. But... You know, Ozzy's only got a year left, so I mean, he'd have to make a decision pretty quick here. Um, but I think that the biggest reason that they retain that line coach is to keep Ozzy there because Ozzy's a really good player. So, um, long story short, I think that 
Um, I, I think that it, give me give me the spring. Uh, let's see what George Fitzpatrick can do. Let's see what Tigre can do. Let's see what Luke Montgomery can do. Uh, let's see what Josh Simmons could do. Because again, like I mean, people can be ready to jump off the bridge, but I like Josh Simmons. If you have Josh Simmons and, and Josh Fryer at tackle, I think we can win a ton of games. They're big guys. They're athletic. They're veteran. Uh, another year in the system. And again, Josh Fryer was first team all big 10 last year. So it wasn't like he was trash. Like he wasn't dog water. Again, I don't know where this narrative comes from. Like I thought he was good last year. Gave him a couple sacks, but Hey, played some good players. You know, it kind of is what it is. Um, you know, he was coming off that knee that he, he suffered in 21. So he was, you know, he was a you know year and a half removed from tearing his ACL on a freak accident, uh, warming up for the Michigan game in 21 up there. Uh, so excuse me, 22 up there. So, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, uh, or yeah, it was 21. Yeah. 21 is when we were up there. That, that was the first loss when we were up there. Um, but yeah, but let me, let me get through spring before I really call off the ducks. Cause again, the thing about the transfer portal, especially on the O line is if you bring somebody in, you're probably going to lose a guy or two, you know? So you got to make sure that you know, it, it's not like these guys are, it's not like you're signing a free agent in the NFL and you have these guys under contract. Like, I mean, you bring in, you bring in Aussie, you probably lose Tigra, probably lose somebody, because uh, they're not all going to stay if you keep pushing them back down the depth chart when they go from having a chance to start um, to playing. Uh, but your thoughts on that, Nevada? Do you think we need any offensive line transfers after spring ball? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it just has to be the right. It would have to be a guy that's superhuman. Now, the good news is every team – and college football is on sale during that period of time. It's open season. You can look at it. Every player in college football knows who the big dogs are going to be in 2024, and there's no bigger dog. There's no shinier toy than Ohio State football. So we're going to be an attractive in a destination. Our NILs on point. Um, so we've got a lot of things going for us. But, you know, do you want to lose Zen Mikulski? Do you want to lose Tigra? Do you want to lose... George said, Patrick, you want to lose Luke Montgomery or Josh Padilla or, you know, I mean, you just don't know what the impact's going to be. And, you know, our record on bringing down offensive linemen the last couple of years is mixed. Jimmy Simmons hit. Victor Cutler, huge miss. So um, it's not like we're just bringing in guys and they're all Justin Fields type transfers or they're all, you know, Jonah Jackson type transfers. It's been a mixed bag. So if you're going to do it, you better be sure. It better be a clear upgrade, a guy that can you know help you win the national championship this year. Because there there is going to be a reaction. Uh, it's the law of physics. For everything good, there's going to be something bad, and something's going to come out the other side. And you, you just have to make sure that you're doing it. But um, yeah, I think you know I think Ohio State is seeking that exact answer right now, and that's why they've been so aggressive in terms of moving. They are trying every possible different line combination right now, including moving Josh Simmons from the left side to the right side, um, which is a really interesting move. And you made a great point the other day, um, thing, which means maybe they're shopping for that left tackle. Maybe they're looking for that other guy. Uh, I haven't heard that anywhere else, but I, when you said it, I was like, man, that's a really good point. And uh, there's a reason they're doing it. I'm not sure what it is, but they're doing it. And they're, they're flopping him on the right side. I know he was a natural right tackle. But that makes sense in the context of you're bringing in another left one or you got somebody that, you know, that, that's obviously more natural on the left side. So um, I think we're going to watch spring ball. We'll have a much better answer for you guys over the next few weeks on that. But we'll, we'll definitely get you an answer on that one. Yeah, I, I, I just think people have to realize, like, some guys are just naturally more comfortable on one side. of the, like, like, Josh Fryer wasted all spring last year playing left tackle. Like, I, I said it. I watched him, you know, spring game, practice – he did not look comfortable out there. He looked miserable. Um, and if you haven't played it, you probably can't sense it like I can, but I could see it. And I was like, please put him back at right tackle. And then sure as can be, season starts, he's back at right tackle. And they had Josh Simmons uh, shift over to left. And Josh Simmons is a better athlete than Josh Fryer, but they're both really good. And they're both good athletes. So, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, if you want to keep this here tackle, I think said, now Josh Fryer wants to play guard. That's kind of the, the hard part is that, you know, when you're, when your position in the NFL is guard, but your best position to help the 2024 20, Buckeyes is tackle, like, you know, what, what will, it's like the, the, the thing about the two wolves, like which, whatever wolf you feed is the winner. Like that's kind of like the, where you're at right here. You know, it's like, I, 
you know, do you, do you help the team or do you help your draft stock? And I mean, I think Josh Fryer is like, Hey, I'll do whatever it takes to help the team. But in the perfect world, one of these young tackles would reach up and just grab that job. So I think when they put the pads on next week, there will be a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, movement on the depth chart. Patriot. Thank you for the 10 Kirk. We need you to work douchebag onto one of your hoodies. It never gets old. Go army. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you for your support. And also thank you for your service. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know why I love using that word, but I mean, like when it applies to Michigan fans or people that are like kind of just total idiots that, um, don't really know football that have to act like they know football for, for their jobs. Like I think they're douchebags and that's what I call them. And I'm not apologizing for that. Cause I think I'm right on that. So, uh, this is my opinion. Um, Nevada, uh, would you wear a hoodie if I designed it and it cleverly said the word douchebag on it somewhere? I, I do like I, I do I do like that, but on a, on a serious note, even though that is very funny, camo hoodie. How about camo hoodie? It's like kind of a tribute to our service member, but, but but the scoop on it to go with the camo colors on that. I I would definitely get, I would definitely be in line for one of those. Is that so that like when we have a scoop meetup, you can do like your Irish exit and no one will see you leave because you'll be full head to toe camo? Dude, that when I'm at why. those things, I, I met everybody. When I'm at those meetings, no, I, I know I you did. Ed, you were you, uh, yeah. you were great. I worked the tables, man. I worked the thing there. Like uh, I'm you, like a, like a I'm like a waitress at Hooters. There, waiting the tables right there. I'm just like going from table to table. Do you know, think, hello, hi, I'm Katie. I'm your hostess here. You make sure you get the wings. But yeah, no, I'm 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 doing it. But no, the camo camo. I think a camo hoodie with scoop on it would be fire, man. I like that idea. Mickey Mouse, aka Nevada no. Duck. I like everybody it. Loves, everybody loves the mouse. Uh, Sloth Nation, thanks for the five. Uh, how did you two meet each other? Fun fact I played against Quinchon Judkins in high school. Shocking, he was very good and we lost it. Well, that must mean that you're uh, down in Pike Road slash uh, Montgomery, Alabama ish territory, unless you played him in the playoffs. But um, Jerry Kokian, who is one of our uh, really dear friends, is down in Montgomery. He's the best. So uh, Quinshawn is from right up the road at, at Pike Road. So uh, we met uh, on Scout. Scout.com had a board, uh, RIP Scout. It got bought by 247. It no longer exists. But I was working fresh out of getting my MBA, trying to establish myself in business, thought joining a message board would be good networking. Um, obviously still had great information just like now. Uh, so I kind of tell my spiel and talk about stuff and whatever. And, uh, and Nevada reached out to me. He happened to be in town. We went to lunch, uh, with his family. It was fantastic. We had a great time and we've kind of been, you know, together ever since. And then we moved over to rivals together. Uh, and then we started the scoop together, you know, and we've been through, you know, some, uh, some stuff together, you would say. Um, but you know, when we're, together like if people go against us they usually get stomped so uh it's been really good uh really powerful ally uh, one of my best friends in life and it's been really good uh to work together because we have uh we have a lot of alignment and we talk all day and i think that when you run a business with somebody you better have like an open line of communication and be talking constantly because all we ever obsess over is how to make this thing better how to make the product better how to make the podcast better how to be more informative, how to get better information, um, how to be more engaging. Like, and we talk about, we probably talked, I'm not even kidding, like seven to 10 times a day, like calling each other constantly. Hey, what about this? And, and plus we podcast for two hours every night. So I don't know if there's another human being on this earth I talk to more than him. I mean, Kim, my wife, who I live with, obviously is it. But outside of that, I think it's Nevada and the next 50 people added up probably is as much as I talk to Nevada. Uh, Nevada, uh, I think that you probably agree that's how we met because that's indisputable. Um, but your thoughts? Do you want to add anything to that to our little uh, our little relationship? No, no just it's it, like it's a, it, it's a great thing because Kirk and I don't talk about the same things. We don't have the same life experiences. Kirk is, you know, the player, the coach, the All American, the tree in the grove, Ohio boy, and you know my background more is business, agent world, sponsorship other sports so I, I think it's good that we can kind of keep the podcast topical because we can cover a lot of different ground because we're not there's not a lot of overlap between us and i learn 
every show from Kirk about stuff and about football and about coaching and about stuff. And, and I know he learns from me as well. So it's, uh, I think it's a good, uh, it's a good combination. And we, as Kirk said, we really try to make it interesting. And we're, and we're just so glad you guys are all here and sharing it with us. And, and the funny thing about Nevada, and I'm not going to go too deep in this, but like he is exceptionally understated. Like he founded teams and built teams and ran teams and, I'm talking like really successful teams at all levels, you know, pro, minor, whatever. Uh, He talks about the Savannah Bananas. Like the guy who runs the Savannah Bananas worked for Nevada. And he'll never say that, but he did. Gave him his first job, correct? Correct. Yeah, and and he's (laughs) turned into this wildly successful. Like if you guys don't know what the Savannah Bananas are, go. here's what I want you guys to do. Because they're coming to Columbus. They're coming to um, Huntington Park in Columbus. That is like the hottest ticket of the entire summer is seeing the Savannah Bananas because they're really entertaining and people want to take their kids and they sell out every venue. And so this is a guy that worked for Nevada Buck um, and was a young guy, a super, super smart guy. Uh, HBO Real Sports, which is, doesn't even exist anymore. They had their last episode like two months ago. They did a great expose on the Savannah Bananas. And this guy took a product that universally – is kind of just, you know, discarded, you know, like single, like it's like lower than single A baseball. It's literally like, like, I don't even know how to describe it. Like guys that make, you know, 20 bucks a week playing baseball. And he turned it into this spectacle where they like dance and they joke and they're entertained. Again, you guys have seen the Harlem Globetrotters. It's the same shtick, but I think it's even at a higher level than the Globetrotters even did because, you know, baseball, I think it's harder to do than basketball is. Just my, I mean, that's why, you know, guys that play baseball make so much money is because it's really hard to hit the little white ball, like, really far when guys throw it at 99 miles an hour with movement. But look up the Savannah Bananas. But Nevada gave that guy his first gig. And, uh, again, he's – and that thing is – that is a hard and expensive ticket to get uh, if you guys are, uh, aren't familiar with it. But it's a really, really cool concept, and I think that that guy is an absolute genius uh, in terms of promotion – Lord Vader Kush, what is up, brother? Again, you have one of the best names on this entire show, so I appreciate you, my man. Thank you for the five. Ryan Day is assembled the Death Star, and all cannons are pointed at Ann Arbor. Ooh, that is a great image. That needs to go on a hoodie. Uh, Nevada, how'd you do on your 299 picks? Oh, God. Put that on a T. That's going to be like, who drove that 400-yard green today? Um, who, who was that? One of the, one of the guys, they, they drove a green for the first time. It was a 406-yard like, drive you guys can put that in the chat uh shout out to the scoop nevada oh i o. yeah nevada um asking how you did on your 299 picks is like the guy that drove the 400 yard green i'm gonna google that right now because it's one of the big names i just want to screw it up how'd you do on your picks nevada pretty good well well here's the thing on the picks you, you go to dagestan poppy dagestan as it sounds poppy p-a-p-i uh, on twitter and you can click on the picks and it's all tracked action. So like I, we don't tell you about the picks after the picks. We post all the picks before the picks and you can see every pick that we've made for the past almost two years, like 18 months, uh, the wins, the losses, the no contest, everything. And, and you'll, you'll see the action right there. So we literally, um, you know, over the, I, I think there were four promotions going over the past four days and we, we literally didn't miss it. And that's just our tracked action, our untracked action. We literally did not miss a pick. We literally, you know, we, I was going over it today. I think we had nine other props and nine other things. We, we swept those two. I mean, it was just an unbelievable weekend of mayhem, just breaking the books. And, uh, yeah, this was this is, this is about as good as it gets from an MMA betting standpoint was uh, the last 72 hours. Thank you, Lord Vader Kush, for putting that on a tee for Nevada. Yeah. Um... But it was, yeah, it was it was a good night last night. So if you guys tell that action, um, you could probably put a little extra cheese on your whopper today, which is good. Uh, Jeremy Moreland, thank you for the ten, and they've been an ultra member as well. Really excited to see the stuff that you're creating for Nevada and I. I'll put that on the show for sure. Uh, hey guys, saw a post about our defense maybe having a bear front. I saw the double eagle. I remember that from uh, Virginia Tech using it to beat us in fourteen. Uh, then we went on to win it all. But what is a bear front? Ooh, boy, oh boy. I got to get the telestrator out. We have to get this thing locked in. Nevada, I'm going to ask you first. Do you know what a bear defense is? Well, I know what a bear defense is. And what they were talking about on the bear defense was basically bringing in a third defensive lineman 
So say your your two defensive linemen are Ty Leak and Ty Hamilton. They're talking about bringing in a third guy, um, to say uh, Hero he, Canoe. Hero Canoe. Yep. And, and then and then you would basically play JT and Jack as outside, like, kind of like outside linebackers, linebackers, whatever you want to call it, in kind of a bare front. Um, and you know, so it's it's. I mean, I, 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 there's a lot of different words for it, but basically. I mean, is it that different than like a three? I mean, like, is it a five-two? Is it a three-four? I mean, um, yeah. It, it, I'll, I'll ask the All-American to break that down, but um, essentially, that's what you're talking about when you're talking about a bare front. All right. Let me. Um, you know what? Let me uh, do another one of these. Let me see if I can do a little bit higher so you guys can see it. Let me get Jeremy's question out of here. So, a bare defense. So we're gonna go bare. B. All right. That's a little high. I'm just trying to make sure I get the right thing so let's go here okay all right so i'm going to draw the offense first so the big signature thing to a bear defense um so this is your offense here's your quarterback um you know, here's your running back here's your uh your tight end receiver 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 the big difference with a bear defense is you you cover up the inside guys so cover up means that you have a nose guard which would probably be ty leak you put him head up on the center You've got a tackle. You've got, um, usually this is an end, you know, and then you've got your other end. You could be standing up here, and then here you got a backer. Um, so that's basically a bare defense. And then you know here you got your corner. I mean you're you're on, you're on a full cover zero out here. So it's cover zero means everyone is man to man across the board. Um, so you can put your, if you get that extra guy in there, you got to put your safety here, got to put your free safety here. So he's manned up, he's manned up, he's manned up, he's manned up. Um, so there's nine. So you got two more guys. So you got your, you know, you got your will and you got your mic. So, um, you know, he'll be, he's manned up on, on, on the running back, excuse me. And then he's manned up on the quarterback. So the, the big, the big thing that is, um, is different about this is that you've got your, uh, you know, one second. I can actually run, let me run that back. So I can get rid of that coverage right there. Cause that looks a little sloppy. There we go. Okay. So the big difference for me is that you've got all three down guys are covered up. And that is what's different between a three, four and a bear defense. So your nose guard is head up zeroed up, right? Like screws to screws on the center. Um, and then you've got, these guys are both in what you call a three technique, the outside shoulder of the guard. Um, and then you've got your end here, which, you know, again, that's why he talked about, you know, they call it the double Eagle, which I think that's like a steakhouse too. Um, but you know, this, this would be like, this would be JT, uh, to Malo This would be Jack Sawyer. Um, you know, and again, they could, they could flip whatever. And then I imagine based on what they've done, They'd probably put this as Ty Hamilton, so I'll say that's Ty. This would be Hero Canoe, and then this would be Ty Leak. So I'm just gonna say Ty L. So that's kind of what they're experimenting in now. You know, it'd be interesting to run this. Um, you know, it, it kind of depends on who's out there at receiver and how good is the throwing game because you've got to have some serious balls to play this. Like you can't, cause this isn't something that is like a, it's like a base defense because you, this is like a, this is like a, a change up. You know, this is like, you don't, you don't throw this every single pitch. This is something that you carry. Maybe if you run into like a Wisconsin or a, a heavy running team, it's good to jump into the bear. Um, you know, the reason why it worked with Virginia tech against us in 14 is because our throwing game was terrible. Like it was JT's second game. Uh, you know, we had like Corey Smith out there stinking it up, and we had, we had a bunch of receivers that couldn't get open. Um, you know, Mike Thomas hadn't turned into Mike Thomas yet. So, you know, when a team is basically daring somebody to throw the ball, like again, um, something Bud Foster, who is the, the famous defensive coordinator from Virginia Tech, said, um, you know, was that anytime that he's playing a, a, a first year starting quarterback, early in the season, he's going to throw a bear defense at them and see what they do. Cause bear defense, it changes everything in your run blocking scheme and it changes everything in your pass blocking scheme, but it's very risky. The reason we can do it is because we have Caleb downs, but Caleb downs 
you know, is going to be right here. He can cover any receiver in the country. And then you've, when you've got Denzel, you got Denzel Burke out here, you got Davidson and Benoson. Like you've got guys that are legitimate man to man corners that can match up with anybody. So it makes sense to run this. If your guys in the back end are going to get barbecued, if they're going to get cooked by the wide receivers, you're going to get destroyed. You know, like again, when we're, you know, like, like we don't see a lot of bear defense. Um, you know, like when we had like CJ Stroud, like that'd be like committing suicide. Like when we had CJ and Garrett Wilson and Olave and those guys, like you can't run man to man against those guys the whole game. Like they're going to destroy you because they're too good. They're too fast. They're going to get open. Um, cause like I said, it's, it's risky. Again, it's kind of like when, um, you know, we ran some, some cover zero stuff against Michigan, uh, at home in 22, um, you know, and, and we gave up some of those long runs. Cause if, if there's nobody home, then all of a sudden it's like a 70 yard touchdown, either run or, or pass. So, but that's what bear defense is. The, the thing that makes a bear defense different from a three, four defense. Cause I know a lot of you guys play Madden. A lot of you guys are probably Pittsburgh Steelers fans that, you know, the three, four defense puts the, the ends out on the tackle. Like you don't cover up the guards in a three, four defense. It's, 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 it's a totally different defense. So, but I think that, um, I think Jim Knowles is actually just being smart and throwing out there that we're going to run the double Eagle defense because then it makes some idiot intern at Akron, who's our first game, have to like break that down and get ready for it. And, you know, but like, this is like, you're not going to show bear defense against Akron or some team. Like you, you would hold that for when you're playing Oregon or something. If you want to throw like a quick fastball at them, because again, we have safeties that can run and cover, especially with Caleb, I mean, Caleb Downs makes that defense a factor, but, but also having Davidson um, and Denzel Burke back. I mean, cause Again, if this is two years ago where we stunk at cornerback, you can't run better. But when you have legitimate, sticky man-to-man guys that can stick to these receivers and and not get scorched, it's it's a whole different ball of So that's a great question, though. Again, I love when you guys ask me some of these X's and O things because if you haven't lived in that world, it's hard to explain it. Because again, I I we I as an O line coach, like you better have a plan for bear defense. And in 2014, like Ed Warner got he got caught flat-footed, and that was like one of those things where you know, when you're a line coach and your contemporaries see that you can't handle bare defense, like it's almost like you're like a laughing stock because we we look like 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 Tom and Jerry. Like we look like we'd never seen that in our lives. And I know for a fact because I actually designed the playbook. Um, I didn't design it, but like I use Florida Gators, the Florida Gators playbook. Every single play that we have has a bear check, like where you can you can get to what you need to do against bear because it's just so totally different compared to to any other defense that that you see. Okay. Is that good? Nevada, you have anything to add to bear defense? I don't think, I think that's exactly what I would have said had I been describing it. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, uh, I, I love this show. Cause I never know what I'm going to get to talk about, but yeah, I get to do the bear diatribe. Oh, Nevada, Alexander Presley. Thank you for the five. This is a great question. Why was Cam Newton successful in the NFL yet? Terrell Pryor wasn't. Ooh. Um, you want to start with that one, Nevada? Well, I mean, my opinion was, I mean, look, Cam Newton was a pretty accurate passer in the NFL. I mean, he could stand in there off his back foot and throw the, you know, make throw the ball out there to spots and make throws that I didn't think that he was uh, capable of. But he was a, he was an accurate passer and he was a tank when he ran the ball. Took a lot of punishment. Nobody took more shots than Cam did. And I, and, and I don't like Cam Newton, but I grew to begrudgingly really respect that guy. Um, I think he's a knucklehead, think he's a disaster after football, but when he was in his prime, uh, he was a, he was a tour de force in, the in, you know, in the NFL game. And at that time, you know, the, there was a premium on being up a, you know, a, a, having some accuracy as a passer. And I think that that inconsistency as a passer is really what kind of undid Terrell, uh, at that time. And do I think that it, it'd be different in 2024? Yeah. I think in 2024 that some team would figure out how to use Terrell prior the way that the, uh, the Ravens use Lamar Jackson, and I think he would be uh, unbelievably dynamic in that role. And, and uh, but different times call for different things. But that's how that's how I think they were different. Yeah, and, and like I'm gonna preface this with saying I really like Terrell Pryor. I think he's a he, he he was a gamer, tough kid. I mean, he carried us. I mean, you know, I, I can't imagine if we didn't have Terrell Pryor in 08, 09, and ten. I have no idea. I mean, we might have fallen off the wagon because he he carried those offenses in a major way. Um, 
but I think Cam Newton was just a, a much tougher football player. Like Cam Newton was a guy and Auburn did him no favors. Cause I mean, they would run him in the a gap and I used to study cam a lot. Um, when we were, when we were here to play Arkansas, one of the games I watched the most was the, the Arkansas versus Auburn game. And Cam Newton had maybe my favorite play in college football history where they sap him the ball and they run quarterback power on the, like the two yard line. And he killed their top, their top linebacker. Their best linebacker um, was a really good player at Arkansas. I still remember this. And I watched that play and Cam just, uh, uh, just annihilates him. And I was like, this guy is a super mutant. This guy is unbelievably tough because quarterbacks don't want to take, like, like Terrell was a guy that, he, you know, he was always in protective mode. He was always trying to get out of bounds. He didn't want to go in the A gap. And again, I'm not saying he wasn't a great player, but he wasn't anywhere near as tough as Cam Newton. And again, again, Cam, you know, for whatever you want to say about him off the field, you know, he's knucklehead getting in stupid seven on seven fights, whatever. He says all kinds of idiotic stuff on his podcast. Now he was a monster on the field, especially in his prime. I mean, again, he won an NFL MVP. So that's, you know, he took the Carolina Panthers to the Super Bowl. They lost to, you know, Peyton Manning and the, and the, and the Broncos. So, I mean, he had a nice run there. Now, obviously he's, he's done now, but you know, you don't win the NFL MVP by just like some freak accident. Um, and, and frankly, he played on teams that I don't think were very talented. You know, he had Steve Smith and, you know, but like when they went to the Super Bowl, he's thrown it to, it's not like it's, you know, some, some guys, but I mean, they didn't have like a bunch of hall of famers out there playing wide receiver. You know, that it actually, had, I mean, that Philly, that Ted Ginn, good players, great Buckeyes. Um, but it wasn't like he had, you know, like, like Peyton had like, you know, Demarius Thomas and Eric Decker and, you know, guys that were like, like superstars, you know, guys that were like pro bowl level dudes. And Cam never had that, you know, he had Steve Smith kind of at the end of his career, but I don't even think Steve, Steve Smith might not been on, he might not have been on that team by the time they went to the Super Bowl. But again, um, I just think Cam was, you know, he was tougher and he was the guy that, uh, he made his hay running the ball in the goal line. Like he was a monster down inside the 10 yard line where they sap in the ball and he just go kill people. And, but again, that, that doesn't add to a very long NFL career. And he had a nice career. Um, Tyler Kirsty, I uh, thank you for the five Kirk and Nevada. When do, uh, the, in Ann Arbor actually accept the reality that the program is dead. I don't know if they're ever going to accept it. Cause I don't know how many of the tea leaves that they need to see to realize that like the, the doomsday is coming. Um, I realize it. I mean, the people I talked to last week were adamant that, I mean, it is about to get real ugly up there. And I think Ward manuel has gone. I think Juwan Howard's going to be gone. Harbaugh's already gone. Um, it's like get the fire hose out and clean that whole thing out, like wash that whole program away. Uh, so I, I just think that when people are dumb, I think you just got to let them go. Like I, I, I've, I've given up on trying to communicate with dumb people. Um, and that's what Michigan fans are. Um, this is my opinion. Nevada, um, when do you think the people in Ann Arbor are actually going to accept that their program is dead? Yeah, I think it's going to take a while. I think it's going to take until that, you know, because the Ward Manual thing, Ward Manual is is a dead man walking. Jawan Howard might as well just pack his stuff right now in terms of going on. So that, that'll make, like I said, their head football coach, head basketball coach, athletic director. I think it's going to, until that second letter of allegation hits, and then they really realize that, no, they haven't gotten away with this. The counter thing really hasn't been forgotten. Um, it's being looked at by the NCAA as, and I quote, the biggest on-field cheating scandal in the history of college football, unquote. So um, I think when they realize that the NCAA is looking at the scandal that way, hint, hint, that they'll finally start gluing in, that maybe things aren't going to just kind of blow through. Maybe we're not just going to skate on by with this. And um, so I would say at that point, but like you said, you can't teach stupid. And and stupid and arrogant is is the worst. So I, I think it's going to be a while until they kind of figure it all out. But uh, winter is coming, and, and quite soon. Yeah, and it's going to be absolutely glorious. I can't wait for it. Uh, Mr. Jones, thank you for the five. What's up, Kirk in Nevada? Big fan of the show. Appreciate you, my friend, as always. Uh, Kirk, what's up? What's keeping you from working with the O line at doing so much to improve technique? Um, well, here's the thing I've got a lot of respect for what Justin Fry does. Um, and I know that these guys, these kids do a lot in the summer. I mean, they're their conditioning, they do position work, skill work. Um, 
but you know when i see things i've got ways of just kind of you know letting guys know like it's again i'm not trying to overhaul anything because again i've i've been the player i've been the coach i've seen people like try to meddle with stuff and i think it's disrespectful and frankly i think it can be harmful if, if it's done incorrectly um but i never i never think it hurts to like explain um to to players you know and it doesn't have to be offensive linemen how to be like a pro how to watch film how to get a routine and, and i learned that from not just my experience but i mean i was in the nfl like i was in denver with brian dawkins and champ bailey and hall of famers you know brian urlacher like i played with some of the best players in the history of the nfl and you know you observe those guys and you learn a lot from those guys and those guys all have different little nuanced things that they do um, you know, so if you're talking to a safety and you know, a lot, some of these safeties don't even know who Brian Dawkins is, but doc B doc was like, one. Of, he was, he was a nut job mon, but he was a monster. One of the greatest guys I've ever been around. Um, just went to the hall of fame in Canton. Uh, so, I mean, you try to pass on, Hey, this is what Patrick Willis did. Patrick Willis, the hall of famer, superstar linebacker from the 49ers. Um, you know, it, it just, it never hurts. You know, Calvin Johnson, because I mean, I played with basically a hall of famer, at almost every position. So, you know, you can always kind of describe stuff to people, but from an O-line perspective, um, there's just little stuff that you pick up on uh, from being a player. And and sometimes people don't position, you know, like Justin Fry, who does a great job coaching the line, he's a center. So he's got a different perspective on coaching a line than I do as a tackle. Yeah, so I think I could probably help the tackles um, just because I played it. And I could say, hey, there, here's some stuff I looked at. I, I talked to... You know, I talked to some of these guys, say, hey, make sure you look at the safeties before every play because the safeties will tell you what's going on. You know, if you read the safeties and figure out, you can figure out where pressure is coming from, a blitz, if the line's slanting, uh, a lot of times they give it away. And, you know, some guys I've talked to, they've never heard that before. So I was like, well, this, you know, when you're up in your two point stance, take a little gander at where guys are lining up and you might make your life way easier because you can decipher what's going on. Because in football, and again, this goes right back to the Connor Stallions, like Michigan cheating scandal. If you know what's coming, you can shred it. And that's why the cheating thing was so bad. It's like when, when you could, if you told me, Hey, Kirk, it's a corner blitz this play. They're like, well, okay, great. Turn out, look at the corner, vertical set back, block him into oblivion, cakewalk, you know? And, and then, you know, if Troy Smith knows it, he can throw, throw a side adjustment to, to where the, to where the corner's coming from. And it's probably gonna be a touchdown. So again, like that's why it's so important to know, um, you know, really know your stuff. And again, it's not just about footwork and double teams and stance, but there's a lot of nuance to O-line. Like O-line is the hardest position to coach on the football team by far. It's not because I played it, it's not because I coached it, but you know, go ask Andy Reid and, and, and some of these guys, they say it's by far the hardest position because it's so unnatural. Um, and you're dealing with the worst athletes on the team. And you got to get them to go against really good athletes like defensive ends like Joey Bosa, Nick Bosa, Chase Young. Um, so it's a chore. It's tough. And, uh, you know, it's a position that gets beat down unmercilessly by the fan base because, you know, people that don't understand football, sometimes they just blame everything on the O-line. Like if, if our running game sucks, it's because the O-line sucks. If the quarter, if the throwing game sucks, it's the O-line sucks. And I'm like, well, our receivers don't block, our tight ends don't block. So when we average like 3.5 yards a carry, like, it's not just the five guys on the O-line. There's like, there's literally like nine other guys out there that, that there's four other guys out there that should be blocking that aren't offensive linemen that don't, they don't get their nails dirty because they don't want to break a nail because they're soft. Um, and I see that every week now from our guys. So the thing that'll be really interesting in spring ball is, is Chip Kelly going to accept that? Because his guys get after it a little bit more than our guys have in the past. So that'll be interesting to watch. Um, Nevada, um, I don't know if you can... Nevada, can you help with the O-line technique at all? I'm not being, I'm I can I, I was no, trying to ask you no, the no, same no. question too, because it's like it's one of those things where yeah. you know, I, you know, I would say, hey, Nevada, um, I reread it and do you have anything? Yeah, to add to that? No, the only thing I'll add to that is that, you know, to I'll add on to your point about if you're looking for gaudy running yards per carry stats, but it's always driven by explosive runs. It's always driven by the long runs. And the long runs are always driven by somebody other than the O-line. It's always driven by a block from the tight end, from the wide receivers. The nature of running back play is four yards, two yards, five yards, three yards, one yard, one yard, 61. 
And you got to get, if you don't get the 61s, and those 61s only become 10s or 11s, then you never put up the big stats. So while you don't think it's directly related, it is directly related. The good news, as you, as you wisely pointed out, is Chip Kelly doesn't accept that. And that's why UCLA led the nation in rushing two years ago with players that wouldn't even see the field at Ohio State. Um, and I think that's going to change. And, and, and that's definitely a welcome change for the better. Yeah, and like if you look at like the best rushing team in the NFL this year is the 49ers. Obviously they got McCaffrey, but go like go Google like Brandon Ayuk blocking. I mean, he him and Debo, they get after guys. George Kittle, pancakes guys. I mean, he was killing Aiden Hutchinson. Like so those guys take immense pride in their blocking. Our guys don't. And again, I think some of this is because some of these guys are too cool for school. They're not here to block. They're here to catch passes and go to the league, but it kills our explosive runs. And again, I'm not this isn't big Kirk being the old hater, the old, the old OG, the old, you know, back in my day, but you know, Brian Hartline, but Brian Hartline didn't block like he did, like, like his guys do now, you know? And again, I'm not trying to bag on Brian, but just go watch the film and tell me if those guys are really getting after it or if they're taking it off. So, um, uh, D sunny again, thanks for the five. It's a great question. What makes offensive linemen great besides natural strength and size? I think a lot of it is mental makeup, and you don't have to be Copernicus to play the O line, but you have to have, um, you have to be tough mentally. I'm telling you, it's it's a it's a it's a very uh, it's a it's a it's a position where you know, like we saw, um, you know, we've seen kids that frankly can't they can't do it, they can't handle it. Um, like like I said, the media is brutal towards the O line always. The fans are brutal towards the O-line always. I tell all the offensive linemen on the team, I'm like, if you guys have Twitter, you guys are absolute idiots. And if you guys have Instagram, I was like, find other ways to get girlfriends and little sneaky links than Instagram. Like, you can figure out a way. Just go out and talk to a girl because you can probably find a, find someone to hang out with you. But these guys are all on there. And I'm telling you, our fans, they get – like, our worst the worst segment of our fans, these people get drunk. And now the thing that's really bad is these guys, they bet on the games. And if we don't cover or we lose or something negative happens, they are like, who can I just destroy online? And guess what? They go on Twitter. They find some offensive linemen that had a couple holding calls or gave up a sack or sucked or whatever. And they just rip these kids to shreds. And I'm like, you know, you don't need to give these guys access to your mental health. You know that, right? And I mean, these kids, but these kids all want the adulation when they do good, but they don't want any of the negativity of when you go bad. So, I um I think the, the the mental toughness and I'm like guys like these people that are like ultra critical of you like you're never gonna pay to watch them do anything so why do you care what their opinion is on you you know out in the arena playing so what like huh and they're like oh yeah that makes sense so I was like yeah because like you think if those people went out and were out on the stage and in front of 110,000 people they'd probably shrivel up and die they'd probably have a heart attack in front of everybody so. Why do you care? Why do you get all sensitive? Why do you get all sad, like sad panda? Um, so mental toughness is big because I've seen guys get to Ohio State who were juggernauts in high school, physically really good on film, tough kids, and they get there, man, and they they, they go against some some Ohio State D linemen, and they get destroyed. I mean, they get destroyed in drill. They, they get destroyed one on pass rush. They get destroyed the team drills, and they can never recover because they're not tough mentally. You know, and again, the hard part about when you play offensive line is if you are like, like for instance, myself, like how many Big Ten defensive ends do you think I saw when I played at Maslin Perry? I mean, I played Sean Crable, who's a linebacker, but the other, you know, 30 games that I played in high school, like I never saw a Big Ten defensive end. So when all of a sudden you got to go to Ohio State and block Will Smith, who's the best player in the country, and Mike Kudla, who benches 600 pounds, like it's sink or swim. And I've seen a lot of guys sink, and uh, and again, we go through those recruiting classes. Like, yeah, I know exactly why he didn't make it. He wasn't tough enough. Um, but I, but I think that you have to have an aptitude in terms of intelligence. Obviously, in anything in life, it's it's easier if you can get it quick. You know, if you're if you're smart and confident and relaxed. And um, but I think like you know, ankle flexion is something that that I was not good with. Um, my ankles are very stiff. Uh, but guys that have like looser ankles, that's something that you can work at. Um, and I tell young, young linemen, I'm like, guys, I know it's, it's kind of, it's not the most masculine thing in the world, but if you can get, if your parents can afford to take you to yoga three or four times a week, I would do that in a heartbeat. Cause I'm telling you for, for offensive linemen to, to be able to, to, to redirect 
and move quicker laterally uh, with flexible ankles, it's, it's, it's a godsend. And again, the other thing about flexible ankles is that if your ankles are flexible and somebody falls on the back of your legs, you're not going to sprain your ankles. You're not going to break your leg. So, you know, again, like my, mine were stiff and I had ankle sprains and issues and I didn't learn about like kind of the biomechanics of the position until I was out of the gig. Um, and I go back in time and I was like, God, I wish somebody would have told me that. And I tell all these young guys, I'm like, look, I know what you guys do in your free time, but instead of playing call of duty for four hours, go to yoga for two hours. And you'll thank me. You'll thank Christ that I told you that. Cause I did it in the NFL and it was amazing how much better I felt, um, compared to when I was in college. But I, um, you know, I think obviously length is huge. Arm length is huge for tackles. Um, but again, I, I think a lot of it's just mental toughness. And again, it's not, you, know, you got to obviously have the requisite size to play in Ohio state. If you're the greatest five, 10 center in the history of high school football, you're not going to play at Ohio state. Um, so you gotta have the requisite size, but you know, the mental toughness is the thing that's always critical, especially that first year. Cause I mean, these guys, are, it's always a rude awakening when they have to play against some really good dudes, um, in, uh, at Ohio state. Nevada, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I just uh, look, the, the, they've done studies with this, on the, with the Wonderlick exams on the drafted players and the two position groups that grid out statistically, you know, uh, way higher than the other groups are quarterback and offensive linemen. So I would submit that intelligence for an offensive lineman is, uh, I wouldn't say it's, it, it's, you know, the absolute, you know, peak at all, but. Uh, those guys, the successful ones generally tend to be uh, more intelligent than not. And um, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a coincidence. Yeah, I, I agree. Like if you can, because the thing about the offensive line is like, you have to decipher stuff in real time really quick. And I mean, if you miss it, somebody gets killed. Like the running back gets killed. The quarterback gets killed. So when, like I said, that's why I said processing, like what the safeties are doing, reading keys, what the linemen are doing. Um, the quicker you can pick that up, the better you're going to be and the more success you're going to have. Geo did it. Uh, 42. Thanks for the 10. If DeCorey Moore flips and Jamie French as well, will Javon Boggs remain committed? Will Vernell Brown still be in play? Thanks in advance. Well, I think that DeCorey and Jamie and Vernell are on a different tier than Javon. I think Javon um, is is kind of a B tierish guy. Those other guys are all pure A tier. Uh, those are the top of the food chain receivers for me. Um, I think Javon stays committed. I If we have DeCorey and Jamie and Vernell, I mean, and we lose Javon, I'm fine with it. Uh, again, I, I just think that I've, I've seen him. I talk to people I trust. I've watched him. Uh, Vernell Brown's the most underrated player in the country. I mean, he is a, he is wicked fast. And that guy is a, a gadget. Like, you get him with Chip Kelly, oh, my God. You want to talk about like something that Chip Kelly's going to go crazy with? Like Vernell Brown is that dude. Um, he is an explosive, explosive runner, and he he can do any return game stuff you need, reverse game, slot game. I mean, he's he is a, he's a beast. So I um I don't know. I mean, Javon, uh, he's got to turn up a little bit. I think. Um, it's my opinion. Uh, Nevada, if DeCorian Moore flips and Jamie French uh, as well, will Javon Boggs remain committed? Will Vernell Brown still be in play? Uh, thanks in advance. Yeah, no, I think you, I think you nailed it. But, but I mean, look, I love Boggs. I mean, Boggs is a gamer. I mean, he's not um, quite as fluid, or but man, his his on field production is second to none. But uh, yeah, it's Ohio State, so I always feel like these things work out for the best. So. Whoever comes, it's great. Could all four of those guys come? Absolutely. You know, and you need lots of wide receivers. Lots of guys are coming in. The the Ohio State wide receiver room is an express way to generational wealth, and those guys all know that. Um, so, could I see us getting them all? Not out of the, the uh, possibility, but if we lost one of them along the way, then it's just a necessary casualty, and you just kind of next man up. Let's go with it, and um, I think it'll all work out for the best. Yep, totally agree. Uh, Tyler Kirsty, thanks for the five. Kirk, better question as a Forder wide receiver is when do you think uh, when do you think they actually take pride in blocking? Because Brian talks about they need to know the playbook. Kirk, better question is as a former wide receiver, when do you think you actually take pride in blocking? Because Brian, um, you know, I I think that uh, 
you know, I, I don't know. I, I think like if I'm one of these young guys and I'm trying to get on the field, um, you know, you got to go knock somebody's head off. I think that's a great way to, to make your kind of your mark on the team. Um, especially like when you're one of these young guys, because there's a lot of you know, with Marvin moving on, there's a lot of reps to be had right now. Um, Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think Brian's got to you know, get the guys going a little bit more on the perimeter. And like I said, that'll be the most interesting thing with chip is, you know, do these guys react to blocking or do they kind of take the, you know, cause, cause again, the reason these guys don't block is they don't want to get hurt. There's this stigma now where guys think that if they, uh, if they become blockers, you know, tank Dell got hurt blocking. And for whatever reason, like these guys have decided, like if I, if I block and go get in the mix, I'm going to get hurt. And like, I think it's, it's a falsehood. And I don't think that's the right mindset if you're playing the game. Cause I think that no matter what you do on a football field, you can get hurt. But you know, these guys have taken it to such an extreme where they're just trying to prevent, to prevent any sort of wear and tear in their body. That it's almost comical when I watch what some of these guys do. Um, but I don't know. Um, Nevada, uh, as a former wide receiver, is when do you actually take pride in blocking? Because Brian talks about they need to know the playbook. Um, I'm still trying to get that squared away as to what you're asking, and I apologize for that. Um, I don't know. Do you get well, that? Look, look, it, uh, well, I don't, I'm not sure if this is exactly responsive, but I'll answer the question a different way. I think blocking at the wide receiver position right now has become uncool. And it's become yep. like you're a tr you're a try hard, uh, you're you know, you know, this and and I I you know I think that's why guys like Brandon Ayuk and, and you know Debo they're they're the exceptions rather than the rule. And until blocking becomes cool again, until we can make it cool again at Ohio State to block down the field, that's what you're getting because you're getting a lot of guys that are coming from a spot that are saying, no, nah, we don't we we don't do that. That's not why we're here. We're here to catch touchdowns. And blocking, it's just kind of like the unwritten rule with the defense about I won't cut you, you don't come back and you know, run me through the ground, and we'll both go get go go get paid. And um, that's just facts. That is, that is what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I I think I, I don't know if Chip Kill will make it cool, but he will make it unacceptable not to do it. And um, I think that I think we'll see a decided uptick in uh, enthusiasm because if you don't block for Chip, you don't play. And so um, that's going to be the big change in 2024. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with you. I think that that guys, they get this label of being a tryhard, of being a whatever, if you go after each other in practice or in games or whatever. And you know, and that it all permeates out from the NFL. Like when you watch, you know, um, Justin Jefferson or Stephon Diggs or like big time wide receivers, like those guys don't block the corners. Like they only just stand there and watch. And, you know, like like to me, like, I get it. If you're in the league, you're in the last year of your contract and you know, guys do that. And, and that's acceptable. In the NFL. But like college is like different. Like college, you got to go get after guys. Like everything about college is a lot more hardcore than the NFL because the workouts are harder. Um, the practices are harder. Everything's harder. So it's like, you might as well get after those guys and go win a natty as opposed to just, you know, preserving yourself um, for whatever's to come. Cause again, I just think that if you go get after it, like you'll never regret that. But if you're just preserving yourself, uh, you can live with a lot of regret. And Jeremy uh, Moreland, thanks for the 20. Thanks for being an ultra member. Uh, appreciate you, my man, as always. Ooh, we said we'd talk about it offline. But I've talked with the manager at Wilmington's at Buffalo Wild Wings, and we can get us a section. My company uh, owns a nice hotel, but need a number of rooms to see what the discount would be if you're interested. I'll talk to you about that offline. Um, we've got a number of partnerships uh, throughout Columbus with uh, Buffalo Wild Wings right now that we're working through. The spring game meetup is on though. I mean, so if you guys want to meet spring game, if you guys are coming to the spring game or if you guys are around Columbus, like we're going to be at Lane and High at that Buffalo Wild Wings, 9 a.m. on uh, April 13th, the day of the spring game. They're going to open the store up an hour early. So we'll probably hang out from 9 to 11.30 or so. Um, the game, you know, the spring game uh, kicks off at 12. So we'll, you know, we'll kind of all walk over there and head to our seats and do whatever. But that'll be fun. Like that'll be a couple hours, kind of see what the, what the temperature is. I think a lot of you guys are going to show up. I mean, I've had about a hundred text messages in the last two hours of people that are in. Um, Cause I, I put it on our message board on buckeyescoop.com. So I'd love to see you guys. Uh, we'll have a nice crew there and I think it'll be a blast. Uh, Nevada. I think we can wrap this show up. Uh, it's uh, 
It's one, yeah, we've got about an hour and 50 minutes, so this is a pretty good show. Uh, let's wrap this thing up. Well, I just want to thank everybody for listening. Again, you know, a really big shout out to everybody watching it on Twitter. Um, if you want to participate, it's a fan participation show, and you just want to watch, you want to participate, come over to YouTube. You can chat that way. You can kind of get into it. And if you want to find us the other 22 hours a day, we're at BuckeyeScoop.com. Uh, we do this all day, every day on the uh, on the message board, talking Ohio State sports, talking all kinds of sports. And just thank you guys so much for being here and sharing your uh, evening. And we uh, we do this every night at 7 p.m. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys uh, tomorrow night. Yeah, absolutely. Um, appreciate you guys. As always, thank you for kicking it with us. Uh, again, our experience is best viewed on, viewed on YouTube. Uh, our chat has been on fire. Uh, so shout out to the Wrench Brothers. Uh, Tora and Devin, aka Church of the Torah in Ohio 7715. Appreciate you guys as always keeping it nice and clean in the chat. Uh, you guys are the absolute best. Uh, that being said, if you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like, click subscribe, also click that little alert bell. Those are huge for growing our YouTube channel. Um, and if you guys like our audio version of our podcast, look up uh, Morning Scoop, uh, like a morning scoop of coffee. Uh, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, every single uh, podcast network I believe we're on. So uh, go ahead and give us a follow on there uh, so you can listen to it on your way to work every day. So I appreciate you guys, as always, kicking it with us. Shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. Shout out to my Southern Ohio boys, including Ironton. I'm going to start including Ironton every single time because I got yelled at by my Ironton boys. Uh, and Galpolis, uh, you know, my guys down in South Point, Chesapeake, all through Southern Ohio. Uh, holding us down appreciate you guys always love to see you guys at the meetup uh the buckeye scoop meetup will be uh, it'll start at 9 a.m on april 13th at the buffalo wild wings i will remind you guys about that literally every single day leading up to it because i'm really excited to meet a lot of you guys hopefully uh we burn the place down i think we'll have a ton of people there uh, it'll be a great showing for buckeye scoop i think you guys will have a blast and we'll head over to the spring game uh kind of walk like a big horde of uh orcs basically walk into the stadium it'll be great so i appreciate you guys so very much Hope you guys had a great weekend and get ready to start this work week off the right way uh, with a great podcast. If you guys aren't members of BuckeyeScoop.com, about to head on there now. Uh, the message board is absolutely on fire. Um, Big Ten Tournament Week is starting up. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. So I'm just really excited uh, to just keep grinding along on the board uh, during the spring break. And then once the spring ball kicks back off, it'll be go time. So as always, thank you so much. Buckeye Nation. Thank you, Scoop family. I will see you guys tomorrow. 7 o'clock tomorrow night. We'll be ready to rock and roll with you guys, as always. So thank you, Buckeye Nation. Go Bucks.